Thank you for joining the Fire Suppression Systems Association webinar on Introduction to Foam Concentrate. Your phone lines have been muted. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the question box on the bottom right-hand side of your webinar control box, and we will take them at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to download after the presentation is over. With us today, we have our webinar chair, Todd Stevens with Canistraro, and our presenter, Mitch Hubert with the Solberg Company. I'll now turn the mic over to Todd to introduce our presenter. Thank you, Becca. And again, welcome to all to another exciting FSSA webinar that we have put together for you today. Before we begin, I just wanted to give a quick reminder in reference to the 37th FSSA annual forum that's going to be held on February 28th through March 4th, the end of this month, at the Hammock Beach Resort in Palm Coast, Florida. There's definitely still room for those who have not signed up, so we encourage you to uh, check out the amazing schedule that the program committee has put together, and you can get more information on travel information in the, in the full schedule at the FSSA.net website. I will highlight one event, which is going to be Friday, March 1st, which is the welcome reception, and it's going to be an 80s theme. So make sure you get decked out in your favorite 80s themed attire, and breakdancing is encouraged. With that, I want to move on to introduce our speaker today. Our speaker is Mitch Hubert, who is the manager of global product development at the Solberg Company. Mitch has 40 years experience in the fire protection industry. He has a BS degree from Northern Michigan University in chemistry, biology, and minors in philosophy and secondary education. He joined the R&D group at Ansel Fire Protection in 1978. There he held a number of different positions in R&D, manufacturing, and marketing departments. In April of 2014, Mitch joined the Solberg Foam team as Vice President of Product Development and has named his current position as Manager of Global Product Development with the, with the recent acquisition of Solberg by Perimeter Solutions. With that said, I'm going to hand the presentation over to Mitch. Mitch? Thank you, Todd. I'm online. Our next slide. I know that the um, the title said introduction to foam, but I'm assuming most of you people are already familiar with the use of foam. But basically, we we get foam concentrate that we mix in the proper ratio with water and and send that to a uh, end of line discharge device to create the foam. And it's it's pretty straightforward. So. Um, it's it's not something that's really black black science or black magic. It's uh, it's pretty straightforward. Next slide. So just a real quick background on what is AFFF. It's an acronym that stands for aqueous film forming foam, and AFFF agents are the most effective agents on uh, firefighting foams currently available to control and extinguish hydrocarbon fuel fires. Uh, by acting in the following ways. I, I should have put in a little diagram, but this will work. Um, the aqueous films is the uh, the primary fire extinguishing agent. That film spreads out actually in front of the foam blanket, covering the fuel surface and, um, and extinguishing the fire. And then also it prevents reignition by uh, blocking any vapor release. And remember that liquids and solids don't burn. It's only the vapors coming from them that burn. Uh, so firefighting foam is the only agent of choice when you have huge pool fires uh, that may or may not even have obstacles in them. Next slide. Where is AFFF used? Um, it was originally designed for aircraft rescue firefighting after an incident on the uh, carrier Forrestal. Uh, and uh, they decided they needed a faster acting foam with lower critical application rates. And that was really the birth idea behind AFFF. So our operations, municipal fire brigades, industrial fixed systems. Uh, many of you people probably get involved in, in those fixed type systems. Uh, in the petrochemical line, we have uh, both the emergency response and uh, preparation or protection against catastrophic fires. 
The military uses it. They were the first ones to embrace the use of AFFF after the Forrestal incident, and it's also used in offshore oil rigs. Next. Just a little bit of background on the composition of AFFF, and I've got the fluorinated surfactants, the first component you see in red, because they are really the key ingredient, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. But it's a mixture then of, of fluorinated surfactants, uh, hydrocarbon surfactants that give us really give us the foaming capability, uh, some organic solvents and water which help uh, keep everything in solution so that you don't have it sludge out, and then some minor ingredients include corrosion inhibitors, uh, some inorganic salts, and uh, and biocides so that it doesn't uh, doesn't go bad just uh, sitting around. Remember, we buy this foam in the hopes of never ever using it. Um, if we add a polymer, which most manufacturers are using a polysaccharide, um, then we can make this uh, foam concentrate that was usable only on hydrocarbon type fuels, gasoline, fuel oil, jet fuel, those types of things. We can make it also usable for polar solvents such as acetone or isopropyl alcohol or ethyl alcohol through the use of this uh, polymer. Next slide. As I said, uh, when we had fluoro surfactants on the on the bright red uh, chart on the previous slide, fluoro surfactants are the key ingredients in film forming foams. Uh, so we have A triple F, we have alcohol resistant A triple F. So if you see A R in front of it, it's it's alcohol resistant. Film forming fluoro protein is a protein based agent, and instead of the hydrocarbon surfactants that we had we add a protein hydrolysate, and then there's an alcohol-resistant version of film-forming fluoroprotein. The fluorosurfactants or fluorochemicals that are in the AFFF bring two important characteristics to the foam. We talked about the film-forming capabilities, and that is really a kind of a way of fooling Mother Nature because we're actually able to get a thin, watery film that drains from the foam bubbles to float on top of a hydrocarbon fuel. Now, this is not a very thick layer. You can't really see it, uh, but you can prove it's there by, by uh, holding an ignition source to the surface of an area that had once had a triple F. It uh, typically does not ignite. The other thing that the fluorosurfactants bring to the party is the fuel shedding characteristics, or what we call in the industry, oleophobicity. If I take just a single bubble of Dawn dish soap and I put it on a Petri dish uh, with gasoline, that single bubble acts just like the wick on a kerosene lamp and, and will actually pull the fuel up around the bubble wall, giving us a very ignitable surface. On the other hand, if I put a single bubble of AFFF on that same Petri dish with gasoline, because of the oleophobic properties of the fluoro surfactants, that bubble does not wick the fuel up onto its surface. Next slide. There are two ways, to, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but there are two basic ways to make fluorochemicals that are used in firefighting foam. One is electrofluorination, and that's the process that the 3M company used for years and years and years. Uh, they were the leading supplier of AFFF and ARAFFF throughout the world. They probably had a 70% market share. Uh, the other way to make these fluorochemicals is through a process called telomerization, and this is the process that's being used today. The problem that 3M had with their electrofluorination process is that it formed a chemical called PFOS, which later in the, in the slide presentation we'll see that that's kind of a bad actor from an environmental and a health standpoint. The telomerization process does not use PFOS, and so it gets us away from some of those issues that were associated with the old light water brand AFFFs. Um, next slide. It was PFOS that started the current concern over fluorochemicals in the environment, and as most of you people know, that's a very, very hot topic these days. Um, in 2000, 3M company announced that they were exiting all markets that use PFOS, including light water brand firefighting foam, but it also included all kinds of other products that they had out in the marketplace. Probably the most uh, common from a uh, consumer standpoint was Scotchgard. Uh, that was a PFOS-based uh, fluorochemical. 
and that was used on on furniture and clothing to shed uh, to, to help shed any greases or, or dirt and remember we said that that oleophobic property is one of the major uh, attributes that the uh, flower chemicals bring to the party uh, so this was triggered when they did this 2000 announcement um, because they found PFOS in the blood of mammals throughout the world, including areas where no PFOS based products had ever been used so that we knew at that point that it was uh, being dispersive in the environment and not only that it was people who were exposed to it. Polar bears up in the Arctic Circle, they found PFOS in. Well, PFOS was found to be what the uh, what we call the three strike rule, three strikes and you're out. Uh, it was found to be PBT. P stands for persistent, and all fluorochemicals are persistent in the environment. They don't break down naturally. So something that's released today will still be around 200, 300 years from now. That in and of itself isn't a problem because if it's not doing anything, if it's just there, it's kind of like throwing uh, a Teflon ball in a stream, right? It's there, but it's not really doing anything. So the other thing that they found out uh, and, and this was really a, a, a big problem for them. It's, it was it was bioaccumulative, which means that uh, as you went up the food chain and critters in the higher levels of the food chain ate critters from the lower level of the food chain, they were magnifying the amount of PFOS that would wind up in their blood serum. And so that became problematic. And finally, um, they found out that there were some toxicity effects as the concentrations built higher and higher and higher, thus the concern over the bioaccumulation of this product. Next slide. Okay, I think a lot of you may have read and heard the acronym PFAS. This is not PFOS. PFAS stands for per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. And it's a broad term that describes all sorts of products with differing characteristics, structures, and different intended uses. PFAS includes long chain substances such as PFOS and P4, which we'll talk about, that are considered to be, again, PBT. PFASs also have short chain substances such as what we call in the industry now C6 fluorosurfactants that are used in our modern foams. And these are considered to be very low in toxicity. And the key issue here is they are not bioaccumulative by current regulatory criteria. So that's a big thing. You get it in your body, but you will bioeliminate it over time. Next slide. So how did firefighting foam really become an environmental issue? And I say, well, it's always been an issue because Mother Nature has to deal with anything that you discharge or spill into the environment. Um, things like toxicity that we talked about, uh, biodegradability, which the fluorochemicals don't do, but other components of the uh, of the foam concentrate do biodegrade, uh, biochemical oxygen demand, and uh, treatment plant, POTW stands for publicly owned treatment work. So a sewage treatment plant, it has to be able to be uh, sent through that treatment plant and broken down into, into more easily uh, dispersed chemicals in the environment, something that the bacteria can chew up. But new concerns have arisen over fluorochemicals in the environment, and this has become the topic of discussion all around the world. I know on the East Coast there are all sorts of, uh, all you have to do is Google uh, firefighting foam in the environment and you'll get all kinds of hits. Next slide. AFFF has what we're calling in the industry an environmental legacy issue. Uh, as I said, fluorosurfactants are the active ingredient in AFFFs. And we've talked about PFOS, the perfluorooctyl sulfonate. That's the stuff that 3M used in their light water brand products. The other thing uh, that we find in very trace amounts in the telomer based products is a product called PFOA, perfluorooctanoic acid. Uh, and it's uh, mainly used not for generating firefighting foams, but for uh, the production of fluoropolymers. Uh, but it is also found as a byproduct in some of the fluorosurfactants and as a byproduct of decomposition of the old mixed homolog or C8 chemistry, if you've heard us talk about that. 
Uh, so PFOA is also considered to be PBT. So those two uh, are an issue. They're both eight carbons long, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Next slide. So we wound up, because 3M made this announcement, what we call the vehicle for change in the firefighting foam industry. Click again, please. So we've already told you in 2002, uh, 3M exited the market because of the PFOS issues. They actually announced it to the EPA in 2000 and then exited the market in 2002. Next one. In 2010, the European Union banned PFOS and any products that had PFOS had to be taken out of service and incinerated uh, at extremely high temperatures that included the firefighting foams that were being used. In 2013, Canada did a similar ban on PFOS and again, you had to get rid of any products that contain PFOS. So shortly after 3M exited the market, the EPA started talking with the fluorochemical manufacturers and they came up with a program that's designed to eliminate C8 and larger, longer homolog products in, uh, in production. And this was called the 2010-2015 US EPA Product Stewardship Program for PFOA. That is really the impetus behind the current C6 type products that are available in the marketplace today as firefighting foams. Next slide. So because this program um, was initiated and, and it was really a voluntary program by the eight major fluorochemical producers throughout the world, and it started actually in uh, 2006, the goal at that time was to reduce the longer chain products, C8 and longer, by 95% by the year 2010. So that's where the 2010 comes in. And during uh, that phase between 2010 and 2015, the goal was to basically eliminate all of the C8 and larger homologs from current manufacture. Uh, so in response to this, most of the foam manufacturers have uh, transitioned away from the C8 and gone to the pure short chain C6 fluorosurfactants that are used in class B foams today. There are still some areas in the world, uh, India and China, where they're still producing uh, firefighting foams with C8 and longer uh, chain lengths. Um, the environmental authorities consider the perfluorinated chemicals containing less than eight carbons to have a much lower potential for toxicity, and we know that they're not bioaccumulative by today's measurement standards. Next slide. So is the transition to short chains new chemistry? No, it's not. Uh, key components of uh, some of these foams have been around since the 1970s. Uh, when I was working at Ansel, we were working with telomer-based chemicals uh, to produce all of our uh, all of our AFFF products. So AFFFs with greater than 95% short chain fluorosurfactants have been on the market for greater than 30 years, and they exceed most of the challenging industry standards in term of in terms of performance. AFFF with greater than 95% short chain fluorosurfactants have been the ones that have been used for the last decade in US, Australia, and European armed services. Those are the mill spec type products. And once 3M exited the market, um, those products that were made through the telomerization process is what they used instead of light water. Next. The new mill spec, the, the, you know, some of you may or may not know that the mill spec required everybody who had a qualified product to resubmit uh, with pure C6. And at this point, we're saying pure C6 is 99.9% .9 plus in purity. Very, very, very small amounts of C8 and some small amounts of C4, which the C4 is of less concern. Next slide. So I said that uh, what we're doing is we're facing a foam legacy issue. And, and as you're, most of you are aware, the groundwater and soil studies from fire training areas show multiple releases over many years resulting in long-term contamination. Uh, just about every airport and every military base where they did training with firefighting foam has at least some level of contamination. 
uh, and uh, this is uh, this is materials that have seeped through the ground and gotten into aquifers and into our groundwater supply. Um, it's a growing concern in in the U.S. as we all know. Europe and Australia and Canada have kind of been ahead of that curve uh, with uh, some more stringent legislation. Next slide. This slide just starts to show some of the different articles that, that have been appearing in uh, different trade journals and in newspapers, but they're all centered on the fact that we have this firefighting foam that has seeped into our aquifer and is causing problems with our drinking water. Um, and next slide. There are a number of states that have already issued some stringent restrictions on the use of firefighting foams, either for, for training or for specific hazards. Um, and these include uh, New York, New Hampshire, South Carolina, um, Alaska, Minnesota, New Jersey, Vermont, Wisconsin, Michigan. Um, they all have uh, legislation that is, uh, is aimed at reducing the emissions and the use of these fluorinated firefighting foams. Uh, Washington State just recently enacted legislation that basically banned the use of AFFF uh, for anything other than aircraft rescue firefighting and use in uh, the chemical and petroleum industry where they may have large catastrophic fires that actually require the use of the fluorinated foams as opposed to the non-fluorinated foams, which are also on the market. Next slide. This is just a, a map of the United States and it shows that uh, we, we did some digging around and there are 29 states with more than 100 bills uh, planned or already enacted to regulate chemicals in general uh, in this calendar year. Next slide. In addition to the general regulation of chemicals, and these could be anything even outside of the firefighting foam industry, but we have 11 states who have regulated PFAS in firefighting foams. Uh, most are saying don't use it in training uh, and transition over to fluorine-free foams. Uh, also, they're, they're in the state of uh, Washington, for example, they ban municipal fire services from using AFFF uh, on their responses. They have to use fluorine-free foam. Next slide. Remember I said that just about any place that uh, the military had a base where they did fire training, um, there were issues associated with that. And this is just a map. It's actually grown to more sites since I, since I found this on the internet. Uh, more and more sites are being added every day. But these are all areas of concern where there's groundwater contamination based upon the use of fluorinated firefighting foams for training. Uh, primarily for training issues. Next slide. Uh, in 2016, the EPA really got the snowball rolling down the hill uh, when they established a PFOS and PFOA drinking water health advisory. And basically, this health advisory says that uh, Anything with 70 or more parts per trillion of PFOS or PFOA or a combination of those, let's say each had, each had 40 parts per million, uh, that water is considered suspect and, and something that they say you may not want to uh, consume. It's an advisory. It's not legally binding unless adopted by as law by states or other authorities having jurisdiction. We just talked about, for example, Washington. We'll talk a little bit about the, the state of New York because they also have enacted legislation. But the key here is it's beyond just being an advisory, it's designed to provide Americans, including the most sensitive populations, with a margin of protection for a lifetime exposure to PFOS and PFOA in their drinking water. Again, we don't have any hard facts on what's going to happen based upon a lifetime of exposure at 70 parts per trillion or above 
Um, but they had to set that that line in the sand somewhere. And, and so that's where it is. It's very, very, very low. And it's tough analytically to even measure it down in the parts per trillion range. Next slide. Um, I said we would talk a little bit about the uh, the New York rule, and uh, it was actually enacted as an emergency rule, rule number six, NYCRR part 597, uh, hazardous substance identification, release prohibition, and release reporting. Um, and it was based upon uh, the concerns over PFOS and PFOA and releases of these products to the environment. Now remember, PFOS and PFOA can come from other sources as well. Uh, if you had furniture that was treated with Scotchgard or with um, DuPont Stain Master, or if you had carpeting that was treated with those, those are also sources of uh, leaching of the PFOS and PFOA uh, into groundwater and into aquifers. Next slide. This legislation that was enacted by the state of New York uh, looks at four very specific chemicals and those are the target chemicals that they are they are most concerned with and these are PFOS which we've talked about the ammonia salt of PFOS PFOA which we've talked about and the sulfonic acid or salt of PFOA and this rule that they have come up with and again remember it was an emergency legislation sets one pound as the reportable quantity. Um, anything below one pound, you don't have to report or release. Anything above one pound, you have to report or release. That caused big problems for um, municipal fire services and uh, industrial fire services because they didn't really have an idea of mm, what does that represent to me. Certainly, if they have 3M light water still in stock, and there are still a lot of 3M light water out there, and they have a release, they use it on a fire, they're very likely to exceed the one pound reportability. With the PFOA, it's kind of dependent upon how old the, the product is. Remember we said that uh, uh, the EPA rule restricted the C8 and longer homologs, and by uh, 2015, we were supposed to be pretty much 99 plus percent out of any of the production. So people who have older foams, um, potentially have an issue with PFOA. Really the only way to determine whether or not there's enough PFOA in your firefighting foam, remember I said it's only a trace component, um, would be to go out and have it analyzed and then do the calculations based on if I release 100 gallons to the environment, have I exceeded the one pound or if I exceed or if I release a thousand gallons of the of the foam to the environment, have I exceeded the one pound? It's a little bit sketchy. But, um, you know, I think it's getting what they want done, uh, is, you know, taking the, the PFOA and the PFOS out of the environment for future contamination issues. So next slide. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, the fact that Canada and European Union um, they have restricted the uh, PFOA and I'm sorry, PFOS. And, and so now what they're doing is um, they're, they're all getting together, European Union, Canada, the United States, and they're proposing regulations that would ban or restrict the use of long chain perfluorinated chemicals uh, for most applications. And this would include firefighting foam. Uh, by long chain, again, we're talking C8 and longer. So that's some of the regulation that we've already seen. Uh, they would expound upon this a little bit more because Canada and the European Union um, and potentially United States would put an outright ban not only on PFOS, but on PFOA and all of the other chemicals that are uh, C8 and longer in their chain length. Australia has probably been the most proactive in terms of restricting the use of uh, fluorinated chemicals in the environment. And um, they have pretty much banned uh, the use of AFFF and, and told everybody they need to switch over to uh, fluorine-free foam. You can still use it, but the regulations and the reportability issues are very, very tight. And the fines, if the product gets out into the environment, into the aquifer, are very, very steep. Next slide. 
as I said before, we're dealing mostly with legacy issues. And it was based upon the fact that we were just having too much of this product used for other than actual fire hazards. Lots and lots of training. And training is very important. But we could have been using um, training type foams that didn't contain the floral surfactants. And here the contamination um, from the foam results in what we're calling now best practices for testing and training. And uh, if you go to the next point here, um, as we've talked over the last several years, huge increase in focus on minimizing discharge of firefighting foams to the environment. In the old days, we used to, especially municipal fire services, go out and train and whatever landed on the, on the ground was fine. Now you can't do that. You have to go to uh, approved training sites that can capture and treat all of the effluent that's used in any fluorinated firefighting foams. Um, so the current best practice calls for containment, as I said, and then treatment, as I said, of the discharges or the use of alternate fluids and methods for testing and training. We'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. All right, so what is the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency doing with respect to firefighting foams? Um, they have proposed a new significant, a significant new use rule, which is called a SNR, on the long chain perfluoroalkyl chemicals. Uh, that would include C8 and higher homolog firefighting foams or carpet treatment or whatever. And that SNR is intended to provide a regulatory backstop uh, to the US EPA's 2010 and 2015 P4 product stewardship program. So in other words, they're taking it a little bit further and saying, not only are we telling um, the chemical, the fluorochemical manufacturers who have signed on to this that you can't produce any more of these C8 and longer homologs after 2015, we're providing some significant new use rules so that if somebody it currently has product out there, these new rules may tell them that they cannot use those products. Uh, as proposed, that SNR would be expected to have minimal impacts on the production and use of firefighting foams, uh, predominantly because we've switched away from the long chain homologs and gone to the C6 chemistry. But it does prohibit the manufacture, and important here is the import of these long chain perfluoroalkyl carbon carbons um, for any new uses and also for existing uses that are not ongoing. It does permit the sale and use of those long chain uh, perfluorinated carbons um, as long as they are minimally emissive to the environment. Unfortunately, firefighting foam is not minimally emissive to the, to the environment. So um, eventually we may see that the, uh, the long chain homolog, the C8 chemistry products may also be pulled off the market similar to PFOS being pulled off the market in, in Europe, in Canada, and uh, in Australia. Next slide. Uh, Environment Canada has proposed regulations on PFO and other long chain products, and it prohibits the manufacture of foams containing long chain products, and it does permit the use and sale and import of long chain foam products. The Firefighting Foam Coalition, which is a, a consortium of uh, foam manufacturers, uh, floral surfactant suppliers, and some, uh, and some consulting firms from throughout the world uh, provided comments supporting these uh, prohibitions of uh, sale and import of the long chain perfluorinated carbons. In other words, they're saying there is alternate fluorinated chemistry out there, and that's the C6 chemistry. We expect that Environment Canada will include a limit on the long chains in foams similar to what uh, the EPA is, is uh, suggesting and also what the European Union is suggesting. Next slide. All right, this is just a real quick chemistry lesson. Don't get all concerned over it. You can hit the, give me, give me the rest of them as well, right? Just keep clicking. <laughs> Gotta watch my time here too. 
All right. The C8 chemistry, if you'll look to the left and you see the little uh, stick and ball models, uh, and you count the number of carbons in the in the C8 one, there's eight of them, and every place where there would have been a hydrogen, there's now a fluorine. Um, the C6 chemistry is pretty much identical to it, um, but it, it only has six carbons instead of the eight. Um, so C8 chemistry was the PFOS that we talked about in light water. It was created through the electrochemical fluorination product. It's PBT, and it cannot be formed from C6 surfactants. A lot of people are saying, well, once they get into the environment, they're going to convert to the, the C6. It's too long. It's not going to do it, right? Um, hazardous, it's considered a hazardous waste in the European Union, Canada, and as we saw, New York. You have to get rid of it as a hazardous waste. PFOA, also a C8, uh, is found in trace amounts in AFFF. Again, it's not predominantly used for the production of AFFF, but there was some carryover uh, in the manufacturing process. It is considered to be PBT also, and it cannot be formed from, again, C6 surfactants. Too short. I can't biodegrade into something that's longer than it is. I can only biodegrade into something that's shorter. And we know that they don't biodegrade or transform very well anyway. Next slide. So when we switch from the C6 to the uh, to C8 to the C6 chemistry, um, that presented some challenges to the uh, to the foam manufacturers. Uh, basically, they had to reformulate their products, uh, reformulate them to the same uh, performance standards, and in this case, we're saying underwriters, laboratories, or factory mutual, uh, and we had to go back and recertify all of the foams. Um, the reformulation wound up being kind of a challenge uh, in order to maintain the performance of the foam. It turns out that the C6, while they perform very well, uh, especially on knockdown because they move a little bit faster, faster on the fuel surface, don't do quite as well on the burnback characteristics. And so basically when we reformulated the foams to try to maintain the same level of performance in both knockdown extinguishment and burnback resistance, we found out that we had to use you know about 10% more total fluorine in our formulation in order to get that same level of performance that we had with the old C8 or mixed homolog. Next slide. So I've alluded to the fact that um, we also have being developed currently and already developed for, for sale and use products that are free of fluorine. These are called fluorine-free foams or 3F foams. You'll, you'll see a lot of different acronyms for them. But basically, we've had to find a way to take that fluorochemical out and get enough performance so that we can pass some of these same performance fire tests without having the advantages that the fluorochemical brings. And those two advantages, remember, were the formation of a film and also the fuel shedding characteristics or oleophobicity. Next slide. Most of the foam manufacturers uh, in the United States and throughout the world have developed uh, their version of a fluorine-free foam uh, as an alternative to the fluorinated foams. Uh, some of these foams, however, do not have the fire performance across all different fuel types and in all operational circumstances that are equivalent to fluorinated products. Make sure if you're going to be selling a product to your customer, uh, for example, if you're putting in a sprinkler system or, or you're uh, converting an existing system from AFFF to a fluorine-free foam, Make sure that that product has either a UL or a factory mutual listing or approval uh, for that intended application and, and in particular that type of discharge device. Uh, interestingly enough, in 2011, the Naval Research Labs, because they've had such a big issue with all of their contaminated training sites, you know, have been pushing for um, fluorine-free products that can give them the same performance. And unfortunately, at this point in time, uh, they have not found that magic bullet that allows us to transition away completely from the fluorinated foams. Uh, and in this paper that they gave at the SUPDET conference, uh, they showed that they were extinguishing gasoline and heptane fires at about a 70 to 80% faster rate 
than the uh, fluorine free foams. Uh, the issue with fluorine free foams is you basically you need to get pretty good foam quality because remember I go back to that that analogy of putting a, a bubble of Dawn dish soap on the surface of that petri dish. Um, since the fluorine free foams do not have that fuel shedding or oleophobic property, we have to have a very very good foam blanket. And we know that at the immediate interface between the fuel and the foam that's on top of that fuel. Right at that interface, we know that that foam is contaminated and would burn. If we could take a knife and just slice that entire layer off and pull pull the foam blanket apart and touch a match to the foam that's right near the interface, we'd find that it would burn. So the way to do it is to get a good, rich foam and then realize that we're going to get some contamination at the interface, but to cap it with a, a good, slow-draining foam uh, that... Uh, eliminate some of that fuel pickup issue we don't get the we don't get the fuel up to that rest of that foam blanket next slide the fluorine free foams do have uh proven fire performance characteristics it depends upon how they were formulated and whether or not they've gone through underwriters laboratories or factory mutual testing to prove their use, especially in discharge devices, right? The discharge device is what gives us the good foam quality or the lousy foam quality. But if you have a product that's made it through underwriters' laboratories, you'll find that uh, NFPA says use this product at the same design application rate as an AFFF in a fixed system. So, in other words, if you were going to swap out uh, a sprinkler system and a lot of places are starting to do this they want to get the fluorinated foam off their facility so that they don't have any potential for contamination so a lot of facilities are swapping out uh a triple f sprinkler systems for fluorine free sprinkler systems again make sure that the whatever foam agent you choose in that swap out um has a listing with sprinkler heads um but the Interestingly enough, because we have such good quality foam, remember I said we need good, rich foam, we have relatively rapid knockdown. We have good vapor suppression because once we have a blanket on there, that blanket drains away very, very slowly. So it's it's good for vapor suppression and for uh, securement of a scene. Uh, it's also good for firefighter protection. They can walk into, as you've seen so I'm sure many videos in, in aircraft rescue firefighting operations, oftentimes the firefighters are forced to actually go into the foam-covered fuel in order to uh, extricate uh, victims or passengers from that aircraft. And so these foams are capable of sealing over as the firefighter walks through them. They've got pretty much global acceptance. They're accepted much more readily in the European Union and in, in Europe, I'm sorry, in Europe and in Australia than they are currently in North America. But we're seeing definitely a shift in people's awareness of the of the problems associated with fluorinated products and, and a, a desire to get to something that doesn't contain uh, fluorine. And again, they're multi-agency certified depending on who did the formulation work and whether or not they took them through the approval agencies. Next slide. The Firefighting Foam Coalition that I talked about uh, a little bit earlier has come up with what is called the best, pride, best practice guidance uh, for using Class B foams. Uh, and basically they say use fluorinated Class B foams only in situations that present a significant flammable liquid hazard. Remember I said that Washington State enacted a ban on fluorinated firefighting foams except for aircraft rescue firefighting the petroleum industry and the chemical industry. These are the people who have the really, really, really big fires. And these are the people that need that extra performance uh, that comes with the fluorinated AFFFs. But before deciding to use a fluorinated Class B foam for a specific hazard, investigate whether non-fluorinated foams or techniques can be achieved that require, uh, that give you the required extinguishment and burn back resistance. Again, I said there are, you know, there are foams that are, uh, UL listed and factory mutual approved, you know, so you look to those 
to see whether or not uh, they are capable of performing in your particular hazard. Uh, and then I, this says, look for specific approvals or listings for fluorine free foams consistent with the intended application. So in other words, um, if you had, let's say you had some uh, dike protection and you had some uh, foam chambers on the dike, that would be a good application for fluorine free foam because those foam chambers, assuming there's reasonable pressure at the inlet to the chamber, give pretty good foam quality. And so that's an area where you could potentially switch over. And there are some manufacturers who indeed do have foam chambers listed with uh, fluorine free foam. So the, the key here is anytime you can use it for something uh, other than the most extreme hazards, try to opt for the fluorine free foam. Uh, certainly municipal fire services, typically they don't run up against uh, you know, major oil spills or, or fuel spills that require use of foam. So you know, if, a, if a pumper truck pulls up to a, an overturned tanker and it has two pails of foam on the truck, it's probably not enough to uh, put that fire out. It's probably not enough to even start to put that fire out. So you know, one of these things is you know, take a look at where you're potentially using the foam and decide, do I really need that fluorinated or can I get away with the non-fluorinated? Next slide. The other thing that the um, best practices guide uh, strives to do is to minimize emission. And again, this legacy issue, the vast majority of foam discharges resulted from training or testing of equipment. And there are alternates to the training. You can use non-fluorinated foams for training. Uh, you can use uh, this picture shows uh, an aircraft rescue firefighting truck testing their proportioning system by using a dye and measuring the intensity of, of that color uh, to determine whether or not it's proportioning at the right ratio. Uh, you can also use um, what are called surrogate liquids when you commission a system. There are companies out there that, uh, that specialize in, in doing a complete system check without having to flow any foam concentrate. They've gone through Factory Mutual and got Factory Mutual to say, yes, your surrogate liquid behaves the same as the fluorinated firefighting foam, and, and therefore you can use that liquid instead. And so that, again, minimizes some of the discharge stuff. Uh, these recommendations are included in the annex of NFPA 11, Annex F, if you want to go to that and look at it. Next slide. Just about done here, folks. All right, so the F FFFC best practices guide says use training foams that do not contain fluorosurfactants for training purposes. Provide for containment, treatment, and proper disposal of foam solutions. Do not release directly to the environment. Remember I said you, you now have to go to training facilities who can capture all that effluent and uh, treat it. Uh, also, develop fire water runoff collection plans if you don't already have them in place. Aircraft hangars, for example, are a prime example of, uh, especially the older ones, where they may not have good uh, runoff collection plans. And there have been numerous reports of false discharges at an aircraft hangar that have wound up going into a body of water and creating problems. Um, plan the system test so that it properly contains and disposes of the foam solution. Uh, de generated during the test or use those surrogate liquids as I was talking about. Uh, with live fire, there are unlimited number of circumstances. Therefore, any and all action should consider the firefighter and public safety first. If it is a large catastrophic fire, I'm not sure at this point that we necessarily want to just swap out the fluorinated foam that's been used for years for non-fluorinated foam on, on something that has a lot of fuel in depth and, and the potential for a lot of foam contamination. Uh, and then develop plans for dealing with uh, releases of foam concentrate or foam solution so as to minimize uh, the environmental impact. Next slide. In summary, fluorinated firefighting foams are still the most effective agents currently available to fight flammable liquid fires. The fluorinated surfactants provide exceptional extinguishing capability, but also an additional, an additional environmental challenge. 
the major challenge with the C6 chemistry is persistence. It's still there. It is not bioaccumulative, it is not toxic, but we still have the persistence issue. Uh, the environmental impact is being further reduced with the transition to short chain C6 fluorosurfactants, which we've been talking about. Regulatory agencies in Canada, Europe, and the United States have proposed regulations on the use of long chain for fluorinated chemicals. And those are the ones, as we've said, uh, greater than or equal to C8 in that, in that carbon, that little uh, diagram that I showed you earlier. Fluorine free foams do provide excellent performance when they're used properly and on the proper hazards. And here again, most important in the use of fluorine free foams is to get a discharge device that gives you good foam quality. And you may also have to increase the application rate. Uh, those two things, if you're cognizant of them, um, you can make fluorine foam, fluorine free foam work very, very well. Uh, the foam legacy contamination issues are going to continue to grow, and the industry is using is promoting the use of best practices to reduce the environmental impact of foam. Quite honestly, had we known years ago that this was problematic, uh, we could have dealt with this issue in a similar manner to what we're dealing with it now, and all these training sites and testing sites would not have been uh, is contaminated as we see them now. So unfortunately, we can't turn back the hands of time. All we can do is move forward and we can continue to use the C6 fluorinated foams as long as we use them wisely and we're cognizant of the potential impacts that they can have on the environment. Additionally, we can always look at transitioning over to the fluorine free foams uh, as long as we can prove that they will be effective on the particular hazard that we're looking at. Next slide. I'd like to thank the Firefighting Foam Coalition. Some of the information that I got for this uh, slide deck, I got from the FFFC. Uh, we're a member of the FFFC organization. I think all of the, all of the uh, North American-based uh, foam companies are members of the FFFC at this point in time. If you need to get a hold of uh, the FFFC, their website is up there, and you can get a hold also of Tom Cortina, who is the executive director of the FFFC. Questions. Next slide is the. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> Th thank you very much, Mitch. Um... That was a, a great webinar, a lot of great information. Uh, I got to admit, I didn't realize that I was going to have a chemistry class today, but I do appreciate you uh, explaining a lot of that great terminology and helping break it down for me. I can only assume everybody out there listening got a lot of great information from this webinar as well. Um, if anybody does have any questions at this point, you can certainly uh, still go down to your chat section and type those questions in. And while we're waiting to see if anything comes in, I did have one other announcement. And, you know, if you learned a lot today during this webinar, there's a lot of future webinars that we have coming up. I want you to keep your eyes out for. Um, but also, if you want to learn more about special hazards in general, there really is no better program out there uh, other than the FSSA online training program. And there's a slide up here giving a little bit of the details. But this training program um, really covers a wide variety of topics from safety and cylinder handling, fire alarm, clean agents, hazard analysis, uh, just to mention a few. Uh, it's a great program and it's very cost effective for uh, anyone in your company, whether it's sales, um, the technicians, uh, project managers, anybody that's in the special hazard industry. I'd encourage you to go to check out our website at uh, www.fssa.com for more information on that online training program. Um, so I do have one question that's popped up here, Mitch, if, if, uh, if I may. Um, so the question is, do fluorinated municipal water supplies also contribute to contamination or measurable contamination? Oh, that's a good question. And I, and I always tell people the answer to just about every fire protection question starts with, it depends. Um, if effluent from, from training facilities and testing facilities was captured and sent to a municipal waste treatment plant, um, certainly there is some potential for, uh, for contamination. Whether or not 
you would reach the 70 part per trillion trigger level of the the EPA advisory kind of depends on how often it happens. You know, in the old days, they used to collect the foam after a, a discharge and, and take it to a waste treatment plant. Um, luckily, uh, the C8 in particular, the, the longer chain homologs, uh, adhere to the or adsorb to the surface of the sludge in, in waste treatment plants. So in terms of what gets out into the water column, it's it's probably minimal, but there's there's certainly measurable quantities in the sludge if they've if they've received multiple discharges. If it's a, a sewage treatment plant that, that's gotten only one in its entire lifetime, probably not a big issue. Uh, you'll probably never reach that that 70 part per trillion uh, trigger concentration. Okay, thank you. Um, another one came in. Uh, you mentioned that as long as you have the proper nozzles and sprinkler combination, would protein foams be just as equivalent to fluorine free? Um, well, the fluorine free are, are you know, the, the 21st century version of, of old regular protein foam. Um, it kind of depends upon the hazard and the type of discharge device and the operating pressure. Um, you know, probably most everybody is familiar with the B1 air aspirating nozzle that oftentimes was used in uh, in sprinkler rack protection back in the days of old protein foam. You certainly could do that, um, but the, the, the modern day fluorine free foams are much more mobile on the fuel surface than the old regular protein. Regular protein, when it came out of the nozzle, had almost the consistency of meringue on a lemon meringue pie. You kind of had to push it around on the surface, and it didn't flow around obstacles very well. So while you could, yeah, certainly you could use it if you got the right foam quality, um, I would probably opt for the modern version of, of the fluorine-free foams. Okay. Another one. Um... It was mentioned that F3 requires a significant foam quality. Is it recommended aspirating discharge nozzles be used? If so, will this not impact reach from nozzles? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's one of the problems that are associated with uh, the use of fluorine-free foams. We're, we are kind of taking a step backwards. You know, over the years, because AFFF was so, effect, so effective and had the, and had the film, we really didn't need super foam quality. So you know, fire departments over the years have transitioned away from air aspirating foam nozzles and air aspirating foam tubes um, to standard water fog style nozzles. And they were very, very effective. You can use water fog nozzles on, on some fuels, um, but typically uh, you're gonna have a problem with uh, contamination of the foam blanket. Um, and you, you miss that burn back resistance that, that comes from having a very, very slow draining foam. Um, they can be used. There are videos out there that show that they're being used. Um, I, on the other hand, would opt for the uh, air aspirated. But anytime you take some of the energy from the motive force of that, uh, of that foam solution stream or water stream, um, you wind up uh, sacrificing some range, you know, that energy, there's only a certain amount of energy. And if you have to use part of it for generating the foam, then you lose some range. Okay. And I think we have time for one more here, um, that we had come in with the extra hydrocarbon surfa surfactants in F3. Is there an adverse increase in aquatic toxicity? There is. Um, generally speaking, the, the fluorine free foams have a, uh, a higher acute aquatic toxicity than the fluorinated foams. Um, and, and, you know, in any given discharge scenario, again, it depends, right? Um, if you're going into a large body of water, it's probably not an issue. If you're going into a body of water, uh, like a flowing river that uh, that disperses it uh, quickly, it's probably not an issue. If you're going into a pond or some other in some other area, uh, yes, the aquatic toxicity levels of the fluorine free foams are higher than those of the fluorinated foams. But again, remember 
This is acute toxicity, which means immediate toxicity. It doesn't have the long lasting effect of uh, P, potentially PFOS or PFOA that's out in the environment for a long time and runs into the bioaccumulation problems that are associated with it. So all of them, all of it, all of it, all of it is a trade-off. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mitch. There have been a few other questions that come in, but just being respectful of everybody's time, we're going to uh, wrap it up. Um, those who did send some other questions in, I will get those questions to Mitch and we will shoot you an email response if that's okay. Um, again, great presentation, Mitch. I really, really appreciate it. I, I will also mention I received multiple messages through the presentation that you covered the information very well and, and uh, everybody was impressed with what you've provided. So. So thank you for that. Uh, again, a quick reminder to everybody, keep an eye out for the next uh, webinar. That will be sometime May timeframe, and that will be, the topic will be on water mist systems. So keep an eye out for that. And with that, I'm going to pass it back on to Becca to finish everything up. Thanks again, Mitch. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I will echo everyone to say thank you, Mitch. That was an awesome presentation. Um, and thank you for our attendees for joining us this afternoon for FSSA's webinar on foam concentrates. As a reminder, the presentation will be available on the FSSA website within the next week. And again, we look forward to having you with us on our next webinar in May.